The good afternoon. Uh, welcome one and all to our digital and behavioral interventions in sickle cell disease using technology to improve health outcomes session uh, being led by Dr. Nirma Shah. I have the luxury of doing a, a warm introduction of Dr. Shah, but before getting to that, let you know who I am. My name is Delaney Hines. Um, my preferred pronouns are pre are he and him, and I'm I serve as a member of the board of directors at Scago as well as the chair of the education committee. Um, but without further ado, Professor Shaw is currently involved in three main areas of research, one being novel therapeutic options for patients with sickle cell disease, two, uh, the transition from pediatric to adult care for sickle cell disease, and three, the use of mobile technology to advance patient care for sickle cell disease. He's been most excited by his work on developing mobile apps and leveraging technology to improve patient care, understanding the subjective nature of symptoms and the intermittent data that comes through manual entries. His work now includes using wearable devices to passively acquire objective data. He's been recently focusing on developing predictive algorithms through various machine learning techniques and has been able to accurately predict pain. He's working on refining and improving these algorithms through collaborations with multiple institutions and studies using the same platform. So without further ado, Dr. Nirma Shah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very excited to be able to have the opportunity to talk about digital and, uh, and behavioral interventions within sickle cell. And specifically, what can technology and mobile apps do to help us as a medical community, to help us in regards to taking care of our patients, help patients uh, take care of themselves. So uh, I'm really very excited to be able to have this opportunity. As mentioned, uh, I have a lot of different focus in, in what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm a medicine pediatric trained hematologist. I take care of kids and adults. I, I can literally walk my kids to my adult clinic. Uh, and, and I'm super excited uh, to, to have now technology and, and speak to the level uh, of where the future is going. I really am, am very excited where we're going. So let, let's go ahead and just dive in in the interest of time. I want to make sure I show my, my disclosures. I, I work uh, with multiple different companies. Anyone who listened to me, I've actually uh, I've been uh, very excited that most of these companies are also interested in digital health. And, and two in particular, most recently, GBT and Novartis uh, have actually inter, in, um, integrated uh, wearables and apps into their studies as well. So we are now in the digital health era. And I think that uh, uh, one picture can can really summarize uh, that, that claim. And that is that when you look at our kids today and you look across uh, uh, our, our hospital, you'll see them all looking at their devices. I and mean, I think any of us who have kids would say, this is probably what we see on a daily basis. Um, but I remember very clearly 10 years ago, walking into my patient's room and seeing my patient on the exam room table with his, uh, his little phone, uh, the mom was in the corner with with her tablet, and even the two year old was was scooting around the the ground with some little electronic device as well. And and I knew at that moment, now again ten years ago, that I needed to pivot. I needed to change how I interacted and how I got to the patient's level. How do I get to speak on a way that they are excited and interested in what's going on? And I thought. You know, I, I need to make I need to make an app. I need to make mobile apps. I need to use technology. I need to get to a point where the patients are excited about uh, interacting with their healthcare as well. Now there are a number of mobile apps that are available at this point. I've just selected a few. Uh, when I did uh, this uh, uh, ten years ago, I was the first mobile app at our institution, and it was a whole new world in developing apps. But now everyone is looking at how can they leverage mobile apps and technology in general? How can we leverage that to help our patients, to help us as a medical community uh, do, do what we wanna do, get our patients better? And so I've just, like I said, given a, a handful of selection, uh, I've actually uh, been um, uh, aware of many of these over time and, and, and two of these, the InCharge and True SCD are actually apps that, that I uh, was part of in, in using or developing. Now, if I'm to, to give a holistic view about using mobile apps, I, I have to give you my lessons learned. <laughs> I don't want you to, to have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that for many of us who are interested in using technology, one thing to consider is, well, how do I even get to, to make an app? Like, how, how do, what, what are the steps that are involved? And it really comes down to knowing the how, the what, the who, and the when, right? So how do I build the app? Like, what, what, what are the, the, the basics to it? 
What do I use? Um, you know, what what would I want to use within the app? Who is the the target audience? And when do I want that target audience to use that app? So it's really just about understanding the steps, and then you can kind of refine refine that discussion about what you want to get. So let's start with the how. And I thought a good example of this is to say, what what are the the theories and the ability to try and refine the how? Like you know, if, if I want to. I can, of course, there are multiple developers out there that I can go after, but I have to be a little organized with my thoughts. And, and one, one way, which I think all of us I've, I've done, and I've actually done this as well, is I can, of course, Google this. I can say, how do I make an app for sickle cell disease? And, and I just did this last night again, just to check. You're not going to get a good answer. <laughs> just like a, as many of us Google uh, symptoms for, for uh, you know, a cold or otherwise and trying to figure out what our diagnosis is, we don't do a great job that way. But we need to think about this systematically. And there's one uh, uh, health belief model, which is a theory to try and understand how patients uh, want to, to get better. And one is to understand their perceptions of what may make them worse and what things they can do to make them better. And if you take this model and, and then sit in a room and use it as the model to then sit in a room with patients, families, and medical teams, you can actually map out your app to say, how does it address those things? How do I get the patient to understand what the risks are of the severity of their disease and how things can go wrong, but also how can they do things that might make them get better? And, and so that this In Charge app that Dr. Jane Hankins at St. Jude's um, has a great uh, article describing that process of how to go through and map out what are the important aspects to have in the app and, and then get feedback. And, I, and there's a, a recent uh, publication a couple of years ago that showed that the vast majority of health apps out there don't actually involve medical and patients and medical community and patients in the development. It's just a developer or someone who doesn't have necessarily the expertise or experience to know what they should include. So making sure that you have this uh, uh, consideration of all the aspects of an app is really, really important. Now, I, I have done this a number of times and, and I actually wanted to make sure I, I did this a little bit more system, systematically, but I've taken my idea a number of times to developers and said, you know, I want to make an app. I want patients to record their symptoms and uh, let, let's see what you can do. And what you get kicked back to you is this. And, and as you can see, and hopefully if you understand what's going on here, then you, you likely are a computer science major. <laughs> and, and, and because there's a lot of detail here that really is above most of us. Most of us don't understand the lingo, the language of computer science and, and, and programming for, for mobile apps. And so what we need to do is create a language or at least a dialogue between us, that uh, meaning again, patient families, uh, medical providers that know uh, it, what they want, and then a developer who can help you get that. And so what, what do you need to do that? There's this gap between the developer and us. And so I'm gonna give you one example, and then I'll start going in, into uh, more of the, the kind of main focus of, of this uh, presentation today. But the, the, the example is, that, you know, I came to the developer and I said, look, I want to have an app that every day notifies the patient that and reminds them to, to record their symptoms. And so the developer uh, kicks back and says, okay, you want a prompt on a card every 24 hours uh, and, and the patient can't do anything until you answer that, that symptom. But there's, a, of course, a, a, not a lot of specifics to that. So a lot of the questions that the developer then brings up is, well, what, what is a day? Like what constitutes a day? And what do you want the prompt to say? Is it a push notification or is it that they're just routed to the page? Uh, you know, what, what happens if they don't put a symptom? What if they don't put anything at all? So then you have to start answering some of those questions and being a little bit more detailed about the symptoms that you wanted. You know, do you want this notification to be every day? Yes, I want it at the first time, uh, the 24 hours starting at 8 a.m. I want there to be three buttons that, yes, I'm going to record symptoms. No, I'm, you know, I, I don't have any symptoms or, or maybe I'm too sick to report symptoms. And then finally, if, if they say no, then, then they're fine for the day. We don't have to keep bugging them. If they say no, they have no symptoms. So you know you have to be a little bit more detailed to, to the developer, uh, and, and that will I think fill in that gap uh, in developing. And we, again, uh, there there are a couple of publications, and I've, I've noted the one that we put together to help you communicate with the developer exactly what you want. But the what is actually really important. So I, I started to, to give you a little teaser about what you know. I just wanted to know the symptoms, but the what could be for for patients 
texting could just be a simple texting platform. But if it's a mobile app, there's a lot we can do. We can have symptoms being recorded. It can be medication reminders or even medication recording. It can be education about the disease or, or it could have an ability to actually communicate with a medical team as well. But on top of that, I could think about mobile apps for medical providers. So we want to make sure this is a holistic approach to using technology. And the providers as well can use uh, apps for, for their benefit. And that includes, do I want to have a symptom dashboard? So I can see what my, what my patients are experiencing. Do I want to have a medication remote monitoring? If my patients are, re are recording their meds or, or not recording their meds, maybe I need to know that, that they're having issues with that. There's education in regards to the disease for the medical providers. Maybe the medical provider is not a specialist. Uh, and if that's the case, maybe I should have an opportunity to communicate with a medical spe specialist. If it's not a sickle cell specialist, maybe I should have that opportunity. And most recently over the last couple of years has actually continued to evolve with more ability uh, to, to integrate into the apps, to have chatbots. And these are chatbots that are very human. Uh, and, and I basically act as though you're talking to someone human. You can have gamification. The patients are really, I think, starting to uh, want and, and expect there to be some sort of gamification to entice them to feel like they're they're motivated to make entries into the app. And finally, the, the part that, that I'm, I'm most excited about where I think we are going is integrating wearables I and mean, having uh, data acquired passively. So just having an Apple Watch we have a, several studies ongoing that have Apple Watch uh, where we give the Apple Watch to the patient and we just passively acquire information, uh, how much they're moving, what their heart rate is, how they're sleeping at night. And all of that data then could potentially also be monitored by, by a medical team as well. Now, the who is, is the other aspect. So yes, I wanna have all this information uh, built into the app, but, but who is it for? Because I have to customize this app. For example, if the, if the patient, uh, population of interest here is a pediatric population is probably very different than the than an adult facing population and and so the, the different population whoever's interacting with the app uh, and an example here would be uh, the pediatric uh, um, patients and, and families have all made it very clear they want a fun engaging app whereas the adult uh, side the, the patients and families have mentioned that they're, they're happy to have it to be the fun and engaging but they really want it to be very clear um, bigger font, make the buttons big enough so that they don't have issues with pushing the buttons. They feel like sometimes they have issues with that. So again, making sure that you make it engaging. Now for the adult, uh, the, the adolescent young adult, uh, the, the greatest example I give is that patients have told me straight up, Dr. Shaw, no disrespect, Dr. Shaw, but, but I don't want to talk to you, right? I don't want to talk to anybody. But if you text me, and you text me with emojis, I'm going to respond, right? I mean, if you put an emoji in there, I, I'd love to respond. And so again, you have to understand what is it that each population wants. And maybe the adolescent young adults, they need to have a chat function that allows uh, emojis, for example, and, and texting. Then, and then the who, if it's a medical team, is it the provider that is a specialist or non specialist? Is it in a nursing community? Is it educators? Who is the, the medical team? And, and is it even an opportunity to have an app or uh, and, and technology innovation for peers and family? So you want to make sure you understand who your target is as well. And there may be more than one. And the last step is when do I want this app to be used? When do I want the user, any of the, uh, of the, aspects that we talked be about before, patient, medical team, peer, et cetera, when do I want them to use all of what we just talked about? Is it that, for example, the patient, I want, it, I want the patients to use it when they're in the hospital. I want them to use it when they're not in the hospital. When, do I want them to use it all the time? Each of those has different expectations and opportunities for data to be acquired from the patients. And the same thing holds true for the providers. Do I want them to have it in the background all the time where they just use it or do I want them to just use it in the clinics when they have it as a resource? So there are a lot of different considerations of when to use the app. So with that, I, again, I, I circle back to the, the concept that all of what we just said, uh, all the questions and the steps, then leads us to then getting to the fact that we have many apps now for, for sickle cell disease. And, and there are thousands upon thousands of health apps, and there's actually a lot of uh, sickle cell apps that are, that are coming about and, and actually continuing to be tested. And it's an exciting time. It's, it's so great to see all the aspects of way technology and apps can be used. So I wanted to give you a couple examples to, to kind of stimulate your thoughts into what can be done 
and what are opportunities that can be can be leveraged in regards to using these type of apps. And so the first is to one of the earlier apps that was uh, uh, used and presented uh, several years ago at ASH and then published most recently in 2020 is the R Helper app. And uh, it was an effort to really focus in on pain and what the patient could do is in the moment or on that day record how their pain is doing. And, and they wanted to look at aura, pain, stress levels, pain medications, and, and one of the more kind of interesting findings of, of the study uh, was that they correlated the pain to mental stress. And I think most, most of us uh, have can understand this and this it seems to make sense. But now we have on a daily basis this really uh, the, the significant correlation we have. Now, if you look at the at the scatter plot, the, the data itself, you can see it around the line, there's a lot of scatter. So it is significant, statistically significant, but there's a lot, a lot of variation. And that's because there's actually a lot to do with sickle cell pain. It's not just that they have pain. We use the visual analog scale as a kind of simple metric, but there's a lot more than that. And there's a lot more that goes into pain as we all uh, well understand. So our, our app, that, that the app that I referenced that I made about 10 years ago uh, was called the Smart App. It was the first app uh, that, that we used and developed uh, with my, my research nurse. And it was to record any symptom, including pain, uh, but, but gave the opportunity to text the patient uh, remotely and, and allow me to see how that patient is doing. So the patients could report, record how they're doing. And then I, on the back end, could then see how they're doing. And what I what my use case was again going to those questions about you know how how to best implement this uh, in the steps. My use case was that that understanding that patients with sickle cell have high reutilization of care, and in particular at our institution at Duke uh, University, our day hospital, our day hospital is a mini emergency room just for sickle cell, and and it's been great for for patients because they don't have to go to the main emergency room, they don't have to. Uh, uh, deal with wait times and, and uh, um, the issues with just a lot of patients being in, in that area and not a focus on sickle cell. But our Duke Day Hospital has a 30-day reutilization of care of 60%, meaning they come back to the day hospital, they come back to the ER or actually end up being hospitalized 60% of the time. So we wanted to say, can we use mobile apps and technology to better that? Can, can we do a better job? And so we did a study where we randomized uh, patients to either standard of care or to the smart app and, and wanted to just see, can, can we potentially make some improvement by having the patients who were randomized to the smart app record how they're feeling and see it by remote monitoring and texting them back, does that make a difference? And this is what the data looks like over time. You can see the pain goes up and down. The baseline usual pain score, I, I wrote that in, it's 3.5, but that red bar would show me the reference of what the baseline pain is. And then I could I could reach out to them and say, it looks like your pain has gone up to, to seven or eight, well above your, your baseline. What's going on? You know, what, 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 what can we do to help? And what we found in the 20 patients, it was a pilot study, uh, was that reutilization care did come down. And again, 50% versus 20%. Patients using the app were, were given reminders to come back for their follow-up. And, and those patients uh, in the mobile app came back 70% of the time versus 40% uh, of standard care. So starting to give an inkling that uh, these type of this type of technology can be quite impactful. And the texting was, was really, I think, quite fascinating. We, we texted the patients uh, at least twice in this 30 days. Uh, and this is an example of one where I, I texted the patients, it looks like your pain's a bit higher than usual and the weather's probably not helping, but let me know if I can help. And, and the patient responded and said, yeah, the weather change and the wind and the rain and the pressure has really affected my, my back and legs. And it's, it's feeling unbearable at times, but but I'm doing better and you know, was really just appreciative that I checked in. <clears throat> Interestingly, you know, 60% of the patients did res respond back and, and give me a reply. And, and two of the patients who did not respond were, were actually well, patients that actually both returned within 30 days. So starting to get this idea that you know, maybe if we can continue to engage, we might uh, do better in, in helping and managing our patients. So another example, I think, which is a great opportunity to show what we can leverage with, with um, with an app is that uh, the, the, develop, the, the team up at UPMC, University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center, uh, wanted to develop an app that better understands pain. And if I was to show you this picture, I think you would quickly understand or have a better idea to, to, uh, to have a communication between you and a patient of what the pain means to that patient. If the patient was to show you this picture and say, or describe this to you, you would have a better understanding of what that patient's really feeling 
because analogies and word pictures and stories do a better job than, than what we've had for, for nearly four decades, which is the visual analog scale. We've used this for a long time and it's still rooted as the basics of how we, how we try to describe pain uh, for our patients and then for us to then understand that pain. And it's really quite simplistic. It doesn't really do a great job. So if you have patients then draw out, what, what is it that you're feeling? What is it that you're experiencing? And we had uh, patients at, at UPMC draw this out. You can see various uh, ways that they're trying to describe their pain in a picture. And a picture, as I mean, simply put, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? We, we, I think just doing zero to 10 is not doing it justice. And so then they put a, a panel together with patients and, and uh, medical uh, teams and said, okay, well, let's take one aspect of pain, the cramping. What is it that you're visually describing? And they took all of these uh, uh, post-it notes and they, they, they filed it out and, and actually developed uh, an app it's a web-based, but they had it on a tablet where the patient could uh, shade in different areas that they're experiencing the app and then adjust the intensity. And, and interestingly, you can then see that, for example, chronic pain, where you have this kind of throbbing pain and, then, and the intensity could be changed, right? It could be a slow throb or a really fast throb. And same thing with acute crisis pain, where you have these needles flying around. You can make it slow crisis, you know, where they're just shooting a slowly or really fast or more reflective of the pictures that you see in front of you. So I think that the results of the app are, are really encouraging. We see that the, the Panimation app shows that, uh, that uh, if you tie the electrifying Panimation uh, to the, the McGill pain questionnaire, where the descriptors are sharp, burning, and tingling, they actually correlate quite well. Pounding in Panimation was correlate quite well to stabbing, cramping, and sore, throbbing, to pulsing sore and hurting. And, and so there were several kind of opportunities to say, well, maybe we should be using more images to, to help us understand pain uh, than we are just a numeric scale. So I was excited that this is another opportunity to leverage technology to do a better job of understanding pain. Now, I, I wanna give a couple examples to, to kind of round out the discussion because apps and technology are not just for patients, as I said, they're also for providers. And so I give this example of the hydroxyurea toolbox, which was really intended for medical providers that don't take care of sickle cell. And it provides education, algorithms for complications of treatment, but also an ability to communicate with a sickle cell specialist. And, and so what we did was we took the algorithms, which are quite complicated. If you look at this, it, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, questions that go in and read on top of the standard algorithms. And we put it into a chat bot. And basically the, the provider, uh, no matter their experience with prescribing hydroxyurea, could easily go into this, answer some simple questions and know what they should be likely considering for prescribing or, or monitoring hydroxyurea. And then if they had issues, you can see at the bottom of that, of that uh, um, screenshot of the, of the mobile app, you can also chat with the specialist. If you're still having questions, you can reach out to the local specialist. And that uh, is an app that we used recently. Now, we also have apps for medical teams. So we understand that it's not just the medical provider or the physician, nurse practitioner, et cetera. It, there's a whole team that we, we want to engage in taking care of our patients. The Step Up, Step Up Transition app is a, a, an app that was aimed to help patients who are transitioning and, and engage the whole team around them. And so we wanna make sure there's education, communication with tran transition coordinator. <clears throat> so we developed an app which had all of these different transition uh, readiness uh, uh, discussions and, and, and something that I had kind of put together, the who, what, where of, of transitioning and understanding transition. And then uh, finally on the right here, you see the, the ability to chat with the transition coordinator and, and ask like, oh, non-medical related, but you know what's going on you know, with school? How are things going with making sure you come to your appointments, et cetera? As I mentioned, you want to adapt your mobile app to your audience. And for kids, we showed this to uh, uh, many different kids and, and they said, I love your app, but it's kind of boring. <laughs> you know, kids, kids tell you like it is, right? They'll tell you straight up. So, you know, we tried to make it much more colorful. Uh, we had moving uh, uh, aspects to the pictures. Uh, we put emoji slider bars in there for the mood scale. Are they happy? Are they angry? Are they tired, sad, et cetera? Uh, and then we even put badges in there to reward them as they made entries, as they did this consistently, they would get different badges. And it was excited because you, exciting because you'd come into the room and the patient's like, Dr. Shaw, I have five badges now. Did you know in seven days I have five badges? 
So in getting the patients to be excited about putting entries into the app is really, I think, important because in the end, I want to just know how the patient's doing. And if I need to get them to, to feel excited about using it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the Angry Birds is, is good for so long, but then you have to have Angry Birds 2.0 come out. And so you want to continue to, to morph and, and modify the app to get the patients to be excited. So I, I want to end in, in the interest of time here um, with, with just future direction. I, I just have a couple slides because we're moving in uh, a direction very quickly. And all this data is exciting. All of these opportunities to use technology. I have studies that use virtual reality, studies that use wearables, as I mentioned, of course, these mobile apps. But what about all the data that I get from this? And, and I think that that's actually, I think, going to be a great opportunity. So I wanted to pause and just give you a patient case because this is was really impactful because it happens many times to many of us, many of us in the medical teams, uh, and it's happened with my patients for a number of times. Where I'll give an example. I had a 24-year-old patient of mine who type SS, came to the emergency department in crisis, had won the two VOCs in the past uh, uh, year, and has had that for a couple years. His, 10, his, his pain in the ER was 10 out of 10. His baseline zero, doesn't have chronic pain. He's, he only has pain when he has pain and, and, it, and it, he tries not to come in. And it's in his legs as usual. He takes his oxycodone and ibuprofen. He's a rock star. I mean, he, he, he's in college, he's doing great. Um, and he follows his pain action plan. The, the consideration for me is, and for anyone who's trying to evaluate the pain is, how do I know, and I'm making sure I put this in quotations, I know your pain. Like, how do I understand your pain to make the right next decision of what to do? And the considerations include the provider, like what does the provider have a history with sickle cell? Do they know sickle cell? Do they understand how to treat? What's the context and history to the patient and into the situation? Had the patient just um, been in a car accident? Had the patient just broken up with their boyfriend, girlfriend? You know, what, what's the situation? And then finally, what, what's the context and the consideration for the patient? I mean, does the patient have a very severe sickle cell and has chronic pain or otherwise? We had to take all those into consideration and no matter what the considerations are, I get a call from the nurse and the, and the response is, he doesn't seem to really be in pain. I walked into the emergency department room, he had his headphones on, he looked comfortable, but when he started crying when I entered, his vital signs and labs are normal, so he doesn't seem to be in severe pain. Now, uh, this nurse got an earful for me, for, for sure, but, but what it highlights is, is that the, the nurse doesn't understand. I mean, I, I actually tell my patients, to listen to headphones, to use distraction, to help distract themselves from the pain. I, I actually don't want them to focus on the pain. So uh, there was a lot wrong with this conversation, but that led me to the next thought, like, well, how can I make an argument to help the patient and the medical team understand that pain? And so there's digital data here. I mean, what, what I'm, I'm trying to get to is there's digital data here that I should be able to leverage. Just physiologic data, as I mentioned, wearable data, this, that, that gives me the biologic understanding of what's happening, heart rate, calories burn, um, what's been happening historically up until that moment. There's patient reported data, not just the visual analog scale, but what are the other symptoms that they're, they're reporting? Are there uh, patient reported outcomes that we've had the patient uh, report recently? There's a lot of that that I can also leverage. And finally, what are the external factors, social factors? So, you know, external, including, and I don't have this, in, I didn't put this in words here, but environmental uh, socio, socio demographic issues. There's a lot of data there, all leading to pain. And can I leverage all this to then predict pain? And I use this weather prediction pain is this weather prediction app picture because you know if, if I look and says, oh, it looks like I have a 40% chance for rain. Why would I not be able to leverage this data to say I have a 40% chance for pain coming on, or that this patient has 80%, 100% chance that they're in pain crisis, or so I, I think that's where I'm hoping to go. I think that's where we're going. Uh, I, I would say that the data so far shows that if we take all this data and try to map out uh, where we're doing with our algorithms, we actually are having success. And, and if you look at the data, uh, our first, uh, since up to 2018, we were just trying to better understand the data, model the data. These are all different publications I've been involved with and the work we've been doing. But since then, since 2008, 2019, we're now starting to build algorithms and predict pain. We've been getting to about 80% per, uh, accuracy in predicting pain at any given moment. And now we're trying to predict in the future, 30 minutes in the future, 60 minutes in the future, 
And I, I'm so optimistic that we will be able to do that to help our patients understand what's going on within them, to help our providers understand how can we better help them. Because I know many of my patients don't want to come to the emergency room. They just want to get better. And they don't want to necessarily have to, to deal with this misunderstanding or, or having to communicate. As I said, it's a story. It's not a number. And so I really am, am hopeful and optimistic that we'll continue to, to have this trend. So I, I end with this last uh, uh, parting thought, which is that the future of digital health I think is encompassing. It's not one, one aspect. There's data and information coming from all aspects and we need to consider all of it. And it comes from the patient, but it also I think can be surrounded by different aspects, including of course the physician and the doctor, which can include mobile apps to monitor them, sensors, which passively acquire information, the healthcare system, which gives me a lot of good information from the background of that patient, and then the analysis that puts it all together. And I think that our future is really moving in this direction quickly. And I'm, I'm just really hopeful and optimistic that the collaborative nature that we have with digital health is really pushing this along quite quickly. So with that, I just wanna say thank you very much again for this opportunity to talk today. I wanna give a special thanks to specific individuals who have been a key part to the, a lot of the work that I've been doing. A thank you to the many, many patients who've been super excited about having a digital app and a wearable to, to, to use uh, to help us understand them. Uh, and then of course, many, many students, I mean, super smart young students and collaborators that are helping me make this happen. So thank you again. I'd love to answer questions and, and I, I hope to, to be a resource for you in the future as well. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for that fulsome uh, presentation. I think the audience and myself included took away a lot about the future for digital health, uh, the novel applications, and, and the great way it can empower patients and members of the sickle cell disease community. So we have a number of questions that have come through both in the Q&A and the chat. I want to let folks know that you can use both um, access points to deliver, I mean, sorry, submit any questions you may have. Uh, we have until about 12, I'm oh, sorry, 2.10. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, the <laughs> first question question I've seen come through Dr. Shah is actually uh, pretty specific. Um, I think it may have been pertaining to one of the apps you'd shown, but a, an audience member wanted to know if the app had anything uh, with respect to information around diet. Um, yeah. For, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that uh, of the apps, I, I do remember, and I don't remember the name, there is one app that does have information about diet. Uh, I can't reference the specific app because, as I mentioned, there, there are a number of apps now. I, what what I would I would um, encourage you to do, uh, all of us, is to um, just as we do with anything that we search on the web. I think we have to be a little bit careful about what we go to. And I, and I can't say that I have used the the app that had this information about diet. But just like when we, when we search things up on Google, as I give the example, um, we have to be a little wary about what what's what's the resource and what's the background and what we're getting out of that. So I would encourage you to talk to other. Uh, um, medical community providers, talk to your doctors, talk to your um, uh, primary care physician, um, talk to your uh, family, and just make sure that you all buy into what's being promoted and uh, leveraged through the app, because I think it's a great opportunity. But now with the increasing number of apps, I actually think we're to the point that we want the app to be helpful. And, and, and if, the, if the app's helpful, that's great. But if the app is not helpful, but providing information that may not be uh, as useful to you as you think it is, then, then it may actually be harmful. And I'm not, again, making any implications that any of the apps that I know of are harmful. I actually have not come across any that are actually uh, detrimental in any way. They're, they're all great, but they each seem to have specific context and, and many of them are actually related to research. So if you see an app on the app store, I encourage you to reach out to the research team. We now, I think it's a great opportunity to bring up, we now have the ability to have uh, patients uh, a consent through the app. So you can actually look through the consent form, say, yeah, this seems like a study I'd be interested in, this all I understand, sign me up. And you can do it right through the app. So we're really, I think, in an exciting time that you don't have to be at Duke University anymore or at a specific institution. We can have you sign up um, through, through an app. Fantastic. So we have a couple more questions that kind of fall in the same vein. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to reiterate, but um, there's an is there an app for a headache monitoring it from one um, audience member? And then another audience member asked, um, are there any recommended or evidence based apps for to support hydroxyurea adherence? Yeah, so I'll start with the headache first. There, there actually are a number of headache apps out there, qu quite a number. Um, I, I would 
go back to one uh, statement I made earlier, which is that many apps are not made in uh, collaboration with patients and the medical community. So really make sure for specifically for headache, because there's many more headache apps than there actually are for sickle cell now. Um, but but the headache, I, I actually know that there's there's a, a handful of headache apps that are made by by pharma companies. And, and, and that could potentially be good, but you want to make sure that that was done in collaboration and, and, and um, with, with patients and, and you're in with doctors. So Yes, there are, the short answer is yes, there are definitely apps for headaches and, and really it should come down to, does it help you record how your headaches are feeling? Does it help you communicate that to your, your medical provider? Does it help you understand when your headaches are occurring to then give you a little bit of insight like, oh yes, I get a headache every time I'm not drinking coffee or something, it's something simple like that. You know, so you, you want it to be able to be a tool for yourself. Now, the next question was, um, about hydroxyurea. Now, I absolutely am um, vested in this and because hydroxyurea, as we all are aware, is the standard of care for, for sickle cell and, and underutilized. It's actually underutilized. And when it is utilized, we, we do recognize it's, it's hard for patients to take every single day. I mean, it, just like anyone, hypertension or otherwise, you have to take a medicine every day. It's hard. We, we're all busy. We have things to do. Um, and this is where, can we use an app to change our behavior, to make us remember that, make it part of our lifestyle that we need to take it. Uh, and, and, and we haven't published this yet. We're in the process of doing this, but we uh, were part of a study, eight sites around the United States, uh, where we use that in charge app that I, I, I highlighted at the very beginning of my presentation to, to have patients be educated, to record that they're taking hydroxyurea. And we followed their prescriptions for hydroxyurea. And what we saw was, again, in an unpublished way, and I can't give you the, the numbers yet because we haven't published, but it, it did good. We did good. So, so I think we're going to follow this up on a bigger scale where apps can be used. Now, the last part I would answer to, to, to answer your question is, is that there are some apps out there that um, uh, allow you to record your medications. Um, and and most of them are in research settings, but there are a few that I think allow you to free text in that you're taking hydroxyurea, for example. Um, I, I, I would, I'm not, I'm not, I'm hesitating from naming any specific apps uh, because I want you to do your own due diligence, right? And, and I want you to, to do your own research into it. Does this help me? So I, just like you download all these different games and try them out, download these, some of these apps, see what you think, see, it, see if it's helpful. And many of the apps are, as I mentioned, either through research or have to be unlocked. So just feel free to email and say, look, uh, I downloaded your app. It looks super interesting. Can you email me some more information on how I get more access to it? Uh, because I do think that's important. But sometimes we just need a simple reminder. Fantastic. There's one, one additional question, Dr. Shah, mm -hmm. in and around, um, especially for young adults, what, what sickle cell care apps have you found useful for symptom reporting, self-management tips, medication and appointment reminders, et cetera? Yeah, so so I, I will say that there's a couple um, that are put out by the like the sickle cell warrior uh, group, and um, there's one but from the UK um, that 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 uh, is 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 well used as well. Um, and and again, I think it comes down to what is it you think is most useful. The the, the education I think is nice. Um, I, in my experience, when talking to patients, especially my young adults. Uh, that they're actually not as interested in the education the way it's been described. And, and I'm hoping that, to change that. And I'll give you an example here. Um, I had a 16-year-old, a couple different patients I've asked, but the 16-year-old said, Dr. Shaw, th these PowerPoints on these education, these webs that you have there, they're really boring. You know, that they're not exciting. They're not, they're, they're not get, keeping me engaged. But if, if you had like a TikTok video, if you had, you know, some, you know, some sort of, um, uh, short clip of, of things that you want me to do. And I think that's where we're going. And I think that, as I said, I'm relying on some young, energetic, uh, technology savvy kids. And these are patients I'm talking about to help me do this. Uh, we're going to have this. And I think it's, it's where we're going. So yes, we do have apps that have education in it. Yes, we have but for young adults and adolescents, I think we need to change. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware as of yet that there's an app that's specifically for adolescent and young adults that's been as engaging as I had hoped it to be. So, so I think that we're gonna get there and I would encourage any and all of you 
to reach out to those that are working on these apps to say, look, sign me up. How can I help? What can I do to, to make this uh, even better? Fantastic. So while folks are still ruminating, and, and please do submit your, your questions via the Q&A and chat, I do have one question for you from myself, Dr. Shaw. I really, it really impressed upon me when you mentioned the need to educate practitioners as well in and around what symptoms and what people present with. So how can digital tools assist practitioners and help them be educated about what they need to be recognizing when folks hopefully present uh, to the to, um, EDs or exactly hospitals? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this uh, speaks to what I said at the very beginning, which is you kind of have to know who the audience is that you want. And so with a medical provider, uh, it, it actually depends on who, who we're focusing on. If it's the emergency room, for example, we, we, uh, that we, we often recognize that the emergency room is a place where we have a lot of variation in care. We many times, and without trying to generalize, we many times have uh, some discrepancies and 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 not, not ideal situations sometimes that come up. So what 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 we hope to do is then to provide them the information. And one effort to do this, for example, is to take the individualized pain plan, the individualized care plan for that patient, to have the patient have it on uh, their app, and and we actually integrated it within their their medical records, uh, and so they could pull it up the patient. But also, because we recognize that patients don't always go to the same medical system, sometimes they have to go to different medical systems, and they don't have all the same access to the EMR systems. But the patient can then share that with the medical with the medical team, and the medical team can have access to it. They just, you know, they can they can uh, they, they we have been gotten feedback that having it just on the patient's phone wasn't enough. We needed the medical team to access it. From, an, uh, from a location that's is literally the same information, but it comes from a, a source that seems more, again, more um, in, in line with what the standard of care is, which is to get medical records in some way. So that's one way is, is to address that ability uh, to, to just have access to the information where the patients are just wanting to be treated appropriately and, they, and, the, and the medical team that they're now seeing doesn't have that information. The, the, the extension to that is, most providers don't know sickle cell. I think that I can say that very clearly. Uh, and, and we need to do a better job of, of, of giving resources. And so what we've done in, in North Carolina, in, in our state, is, is push out. We, I talked about the HU toolbox. We also had a, a sickle cell toolbox. Nice. And that sickle tool, cell toolbox was really kind of a generic version of HU toolbox, which is for everything sickle cell related. And, and allowed the, the medical teams to, to then reach out to, to, as I said, the sickle cell specialist. And it wasn't rooted around hydroxyurea. But if a primary care doctor wants to know that their four-year-old is, is in clinic and what else should they be thinking about, well, you know, maybe you know, they could screen down the four-year-old on, on the app and they could say, oh, well, I need to make sure I check for the spleen. I need to make sure that this, you know, X, Y, and Z is done. Uh, and, and confirm that they're seeing the sickle cell specialist, et cetera. So it, it really comes down to who is the audience for the medical team that you want to have that, that resource for. Uh, and, and then it's, and I'm, I'm, make, I'm maybe oversimplifying this, but it's actually fairly simple. I mean, it's actually not that complicated now to build resource uh, type of uh, apps nowadays. It's, it's really like building a, a web page now. It's actually quite simple. Um, and so I'd encourage you, I think this is a great opportunity to tell the audience here, um, please do not spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on apps. Uh, you do not need to do that. I, I can say very, uh, and, and I, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of young, young um, smart people, but I, I've leveraged students, undergraduates, and, and um, team members that are just interested in learning about healthcare and apps and how to put them together. And so many of my apps are re really, really cheap. And, and it's really just paying for the student's time because they're learning. And, and while they're learning, they're helping patients. And it's just an amazing opportunity. So, so it, it, again, I, I encourage um, all of you to, to reach out to me at any time. Uh, email me uh, if you want to have uh, um, some advice about what I've done to, to help that happen because I, I do not want... Um, no, and again, nothing against the developing teams out there. You know, the developers have been amazing, but but uh, we have to understand that we're we're very limited in the resources that we have within sickle cell disease, and and so we need to make it work with what we have. And so I think it's a great question, 
uh, because we want to help medical providers, we want to help patients, and we want to put us all together. Beautiful. Thank you for those, those powerful closing words, Dr. Shaw. Uh, audience members, we're now at uh, our closing moments of this session. You now have a short break until 2.25 before rejoining the large group for a plenary session on mental health and sickle cell disease with Dr. Oyodeji Ayanrinde, Dr. Sandra Newton, and Ms. Thea Campbell. So uh, once again, on behalf of our audience members, on behalf of Scoggle, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, audience members, for your participation and enjoy the rest of your summit experience. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>